20th of March 2021 here in Anderson, Indiana. And it's good to have all of you here this morning with us and also those that are visiting online. We're glad you're with us this morning. And uh, we're looking for a beautiful day outside as it is here after all the rain we've had this week. But uh, we've been blessed with a beautiful sunny day today. And uh, we need to enjoy it to the utmost. Before we get started, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning and to meet. We pray that our hearts and minds can be open to the things that we study and talk about today. And we ask that you will be with us. Uh, send the Holy Spirit in, in a special way this morning as we open up the scriptures and as we study that we allow this voice to come to us and speak to us. We uh, ask this in, in, uh, in your name this morning. We thankful, we're thankful for being here. Guide and direct and bless is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we are on the 12th Sabbath of the quarter which means we're getting very close to the end of this quarter and very close to the end of our study on Isaiah. I want to share a couple of things with you this morning before we get into the lesson. Some extra things, uh, we have some extra reading this week, and I want to share that with you. The first thing I want to share with you comes from a book entitled That I May Know Him, That I May Know Him. And it's uh, the day, it's entitled, The Day of Final Settlement is the title. And from Revelation 20, verse 12, it tells us this. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to to their works. That's Revelation chapter 20, verse 12. The scriptures declare God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And that's from Ecclesiastes 12, 14. There is not a shadow of doubt about this matter. Sin may be concealed. It may be denied covered up from father, mother, wife, children, and associates. No one but the guilty actors may cherish the least suspicion of the wrong, but it is laid bare before the intelligence, uh, intelligences of heaven. The darkness of the darkest night, the secrecy of all deceptive arts, is not sufficient to veil one thought. Did you get this? It's not sufficient to veil one thought from the knowledge of the eternal. So, we may be doing things that we think nobody else knows about. Well, right here it tells you there is one individual that knows about it. That's the eternal. God. The Lord beheld Adam and Eve as they took of the forbidden tree. In their guilt, they fled from his presence and hid themselves, but God saw them. They could not cover their shame from his eyes. When Cain slew his brother, he thought to hide his crime by denial of his deed. But the Lord said, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That's in Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. All sin unrepented of and unconfessed. Listen carefully. All sin unrepented of and unconfessed will remain upon the books of record. It will not be blotted out. It will not go beforehand to judgment to be canceled by the atoning blood of Christ. 
the accumulated sins of every individual will be written with absolute accuracy. And the penetrating light of God's law will try every secret of darkness in proportion to the light, to the opportunities, and the knowledge of God's claims upon them will be the condemnation of the rejecters of God's mercy. The day of final settlements is just before us. The Bible presents the law of God as a perfect standard by which to shape the life and character. The only perfect example of obedience to its precepts is found in the Son of God, the Savior of lost mankind. There is no stain of unrighteousness upon him, and we are bidden to follow in his steps. And that comes from a magazine called The Review and Herald, March 27, 1888, is where that comes from. When you think back on these things, all sin unrepented of and unconfessed will remain upon the books of record. It will not be blotted out. It will not go beforehand to judgment to be canceled by the atoning blood of Jesus. That's some pretty serious things. This is out of a book. It's called um, That I May Know Him. And it's entitled The Day of Final Settlement. So if you want to refer back to that, you go to this book, That I May Know Him, the Day of Final Settlements in December. It's a devotional book. It's in December, like December 19. And you can read this more for yourself and give this more thought. But that's where that comes from. I want to share with you another book this morning. It's a book that some are familiar with. It's from a, a series that's called the Conflict of Ages series. And this book is entitled Patriarchs and Prophets. There are five books in this series, by the way, the um, series that I'm uh, referring to, The Conflict of Ages. There's five books. Some of you have, <clears throat> have uh, sent in over the last few weeks to re uh, request one of those books, The Desire of Ages, and um, we appreciate that. And we've also had another one that we have given out, and it's called The Great Controversy. They're all part of this series of books. Uh, the Conflict of Ages. I want to share with you from page, I'm not going to read every page here, but it's 376 to 378 is where I'm sharing some thoughts with you this morning from this book called Patriarchs and Prophets. And it's interesting, it's talking about from Sinai to Kadesh, and uh, it's talking about uh, Moses and the people um, as they left Egypt. It says a distance of only 11 days journey lay between Sinai and Kadesh on the borders of Canaan and it was with the prospect of speedily entering the goodly land that the hosts of Israel resumed their march when the cloud at last gave the signal for an onward movement. Jehovah had wrought wonders in bringing them from Egypt and what blessings might they not expect now that they had formally covenanted to accept him as their sovereign and had been acknowledged as the chosen people of the Most High? They were acknowledged as the chosen people of the Most High. God chose the children of Israel. And I want you to keep that in mind throughout our study this morning as we'll get into some things here in a little bit from our lesson. Yet, it was almost with reluctance that many left the place where they had so long encamped. They had come almost to regard it as their home. Within the shelter of those granite walls, God had gathered his people apart from all other nations to repeat to them his holy law. They loved to look upon the sacred mount on whose hoary mount or peaks and barren ridges the divine glory had so often been displayed. 
The scene was so closely associated with the presence of God and holy angels that it seemed too sacred to be left thoughtlessly or even gladly. After three days' journey, I told you it was an 11-day journey, and after three days' journey, open complaints were heard. These originated with the mixed multitude, many of whom who were not fully united with Israel and were continually watching for some cause of censure. Now remember, I told you, God's chosen people are the children of Israel. They're the chosen people. Well, these people, this is the mixed multitude, come with, they came with them kind of at the last minute. You know, they jumped on board as they were leaving Egypt and said, we're, we need to go with you. Okay. The complainers were not pleased with the direction of the march. Huh. They weren't pleased with the direction of the march. Now, I hope that we don't have any complainers today who are not pleased with the direction of the march of our church, maybe our social groups that we're involved with. Well, it says they were not pleased with the march. They were continually finding fault with the way in which Moses was leading them. Notice what I said, continually finding fault with Moses. It wasn't once in a while. They were continually finding fault with Moses. Now keep in mind, I need to reiterate something here. Maybe some of you don't remember this march. You know, they had been out in the wilderness they're going to be out in the wilderness for 40 years total when it's all over with. And Moses was leading these people. It tells us that there were a million men, but, you know, they didn't, they didn't count the women and children when they tell you that. So let's throw in another couple of million. That's three million people. That's a very conservative figure. That'd be like three cities of Indianapolis. Okay, that'd be like three cities of Indianapolis that this man is in charge of. And just think about this last statement. They were continually finding fault with the way in which Moses was leading them. Though they well knew that he, as well as they, was following the guiding cloud. Dissatisfaction is contagious. Dissatisfaction is contagious? Hmm. Dissatisfaction. Another word for that, I guess, would be negativity. I guess that'd be a synonym, a synonym of uh, dissatisfaction. And it soon spread in the encampment. Hmm. We talk about the disease that we're inflicted with today, the pandemic. How quickly it spread, if you recall, a year ago. Not just in one area. It spread over the entire world. 7.4 billion people on this planet. And you see how quickly that spread? Well, think about that one. Dissatisfaction is contagious and it soon spread in the encampment. And again, they began to clamor for... What do you think they were clamoring for? Now, let me ask you. What had they been eating? Manna. Manna. Manna is what? Well, they, yeah, they say it's very good. It's like honey. It's a bread. And it was provided to them one day a week. No. No. They would have been Right. So they had that six days a week, and they went out and they gathered extra on Friday in preparation day for the Sabbath. Now this is, you think about this. This is bread from heaven. It's not bread from down at the local market there in town. 
that somebody was bringing in by horseback every day to feed all... Remember I told you how many people we're talking about. Millions of people. This was heaven bread. Hmm. Well, it says here they began to clamor for what to eat. Meat. They wanted flesh. They wanted flesh. Though abundantly supplied with manna, they were not satisfied. The Israelites during their bondage in Egypt had been compelled to subsist on the plainest and simplest food. But then keen appetite induced by privation and hard labor had made it palatable. Many of the Egyptians, however, who were now among them, remember, mixed multitude I told you about, had been accustomed to a luxurious diet. And these were the first to complain. Now, when it talks about a luxurious diet, if you study anything about Egyptian history and the, the uh, uh, King Tut and the mummies and all of these things, you'll find that the Egyptians didn't live a long time. Longevity was not in their mix. The primary reason was what they ate. There were so many of them, you know, I said a luxurious diet, so many of them had diabetes. And you may think, well, diabetes is just something I've heard about here. No, 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 no. It's been around a long time. Been around a long time. Going all the way back there to the Egyptians. And it says, like it said here, many of the Egyptians were the first to complain at the giving of the manna just before Israel reached Sinai. The Lord had granted them flesh in answer to their clamors. But it was furnished them for how long? No. How long did they get that flesh? One day. One day. Now you think about that. They've had this manna. As you've already told me how many days they've had that. But they get that flesh for one day. God might as easily have provided them with flesh as with manna. But a restriction was placed upon them for their good. It was his purpose to supply them with food better suited to their uh, wants than the feverish diet to which many had become accustomed in Egypt. The perverted appetite was to be brought into a more healthy state that they might enjoy the food originally provided for man. The fruits of the earth which God gave to Adam and Eve in Eden, it was for this reason that the Israelites had been deprived in a great measure of animal food. That's the reason. So that they could be more healthy. Now we get to the real crux. And those of you that have access to this book, it's called Patriarchs and Prophets. And I'm on page 378, about halfway down. And listen to it. Satan tempted them to regard this restriction as unjust and cruel. He caused them to lust after forbidden things because he saw that the unrestrained indulgence of appetite would tend to produce sensuality, and by this means the people could be more easily brought under his control. The author of disease and misery will assail men and women, by the way, doesn't say women here, but it will, who, it'll sail men and women where he can have the greatest success. Through temptations addressed to the appetite, he has to a large extent led men into sin, and women, from the time when he induced Eve to hear of, to eat of the forbidden fruit. It was by this same means that he led Israel to murmur against God. 
intemperance in eating and drinking, leading as it does to the indulgence of the lower passions, prepares the way for men and women to disregard all moral obligations. When assailed by temptation, they have little power to resist. God brought the Israelites from Egypt that he might establish them in the land of Canaan, a pure, holy, and happy people. In the accomplishment of this object, he subjected them to a course of discipline, both for their own good and for the good of their posterity. Had they been willing to deny appetite in obedience to his wise restrictions, feebleness and disease would have been unknown among them. Their descendants would have possessed both physical and mental strength. They would have had clear perceptions of truth and duty, keen discrimination, and sound judgment. But their unwillingness to submit to the restrictions and requirements of God prevented them to a great extent from reaching the high standard which he desired them to attain and from receiving the blessings which he was ready to bestow upon them. Ready to bestow blessings upon them. Hmm. Now we can sit here this morning and we can say, boy, you know, just listen to what that man just read. Hmm. Why in the world didn't those people do that? Why didn't they not obey these requirements? Now, some people might throw an adjective in and say strict requirements. They would not have had feebleness and disease. He promises that in the Bible in Exodus. If you follow... And I'm paraphrasing somewhat. It's around Exodus 1, 26, somewhere in there, I believe. But if you follow what I've directed you to do, none of these diseases will I put upon you, like diabetes. They also had cancer, by the way, too, when they exhumed some of the mummies and so forth. Heart disease, they had that, too. Sound familiar? I won't put any of these things on you. None of these diseases. But they chose otherwise. Dar, go ahead, please. Yeah, it, it tends to be when we're out of communion with, with God, with Jesus, that's where we have these issues where we're able to be enticed, to think that we're miserable and, you know, Jesus could never have taken it for 40 days out in the desert had he been thinking about himself, uh-huh. had he been dwelling upon what he wasn't getting and what he wasn't doing. But it was because he was in communion with the Father the entire time. The, the You know, I think about this, and I've been reading this bit of information um, about Moses and the people, all their, I, I just feel so, I feel like I want to smack the Israelites for him, you know, but they're not thinking about what the Lord wants of them. They are thinking about what their needs are, their desires that Satan's saying, you know, but they should have stuck with, uh, I, I just, I'd eat oatmeal every day. Yeah. I'm fine with it. Yeah. At least for breakfast. (laughs) There you go. What she has shared with you there is very, very true. What these folks could have been. God still has a very special people today.
And I'm, I don't know if I should say this, but I guess I will. What that very special people could have been to the world today. You see, the children of Israel, they were not, he was not just telling them these things for themselves, but they were going to be a light to the world. They were going to be a, hey, listen to this word. A lot of you don't, uh, we don't like this word that I'm about to say. Peculiar. They were going to be a peculiar people. I mean, you think about it. How peculiar would that have been if they weren't getting all these diseases? That's just one thing. I'm not going to talk about the other blessings that they would have received out there in, on desert land and production and so forth of fruits and vegetables. But just that one thing, if they weren't getting all the diseases that all these other countries were getting, that sure would be peculiar. Real peculiar. So the point is, as I close this segment up and move on to the study here for today out of Isaiah, let us not be so quick to judge, and I'll use the phrase Monday morning quarterbacking, because brothers and sisters, I'm afraid we're a lot like the children of Israel. Now, that doesn't mean there's not any hope. There's hope for everybody in this room as long as you've got the breath of life. It's all over with when, when that breath goes back to God. But there is hope for every person in here this morning and those of you watching on the Internet. Because you're still breathing. I can see you're still breathing. And that is a very important thing to think about this morning for all of us. Where are we? Are we taking this message to other people? We're going to get into that in the study today. Or are we going to keep the message to ourselves? How are we responding? I got a question for you I'm going to throw out here right at the beginning of the study and let you think on that. How are we responding to other people who come through those doors and sit down who may not be, and I don't say this in a, in, a, in a negative way, but they may not be a card-carrying member. Do we find ourselves this morning being exclusive individuals? Or do we open up the doors, just like Christ opens up the doors of Love to everybody on this world. Can you imagine that? 7.4 billion people, and Christ loves every one of those people. Doesn't want to see one person lost? What a thought that is. Go ahead, Jeff. So we got a comment in from Janelle Jepson. God knew the result of eating the way they desired would lead to the diseases you mentioned. They weren't a punishment from God. People like to blame God when it's really our own actions. Thank you. Thank you, John L. That's very true. People like to blame God, but it's our own actions, our own choices. You know, this last week there were terrible storms. There were terrible things that happened uh, down in Georgia. There are people who, who uh, are blaming God this morning as, as we sit here, you know, for these things, particularly things that happen of nature. You see... When you get into that pattern, you're, you're basically saying, well, where's the devil in all of this? Well, the devil's out there, folks. He's like a roaring lion wanting to devour anybody that he can devour. And it's not a situation where we're in, well, we come one day a week here, and we're, we keep 24 hours and we, we say that, you know, God made it holy, so we're going to keep it. But now the six, other six days, 
We can just run with it. No, it doesn't work that way, and you're seeing what happens when it does work that way out there in the world. Well, as, as we've always said, anybody else that has any comments, feel free to send them in. And those of you in the room, I would ask you this. Uh, when you have a comment like uh, Dar did earlier, come to the microphone and share it with us so everybody can hear it because the people at home cannot hear your comments if you are sitting in the pews. And we're going to read some Bible text today. And those of you uh, know uh, how we do that here. Uh, if you, for some reason, do not want to, uh, to read, just kind of give me a little uh, wave or something there so that I won't uh, call upon you. The uh, page 92 of our study guide today, it's called The Desire of Nations. And in the text is from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 3. It says, The Gentiles shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, you think about that. This is Isaiah. He's a prophet. He's telling them. He's, he's foretelling what's going to happen. That Gentiles. Now, you know who the Gentiles are, right? I already told you who the children of Israel were. They were chosen by God. God's chosen people. And what they were to be to the rest of the world. Now, the Gentiles... They were the people that uh, Jesus got criticized for going out and, and going to their homes and taking meals with them and breaking bread and so forth. Because, you see, they were, they were unclean people. Got to stay away from those people. They're unclean. That's like today. Somebody might say, I need to stay away from the alcoholics. I need to stay away from the drug users. I need to stay away from the prostitutes because somebody may see me talking to somebody like that. and Aha! That didn't seem to matter to Jesus. He was with all those people, all of them. And so it says, The Gentiles the Gentile shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Do you know what that's a promise of? That's a promise that these folks are going to buy in to what you're talking about. Now, there's just one catch to that. You know what the catch is? Got to be with them, and you got to also do what? Speak to them and share the word. Still looking for a little word with four letters. Love. Hmm. Love. Huh. There are people having all kinds of seminars these days and training sessions that go on to teach people how to reach other people. They're all out there. They're out there in the world also, you know, they're within the Christian world and the secular world. People, you know, teaching that, that stuff. Well, I'll tell you this, and I haven't written a book. I've done some life experiences along the way. And what I have found is that if you treat people the way you would like to be treated you'll probably come out in a pretty good situation. Now, I'm not saying there's not going to be any trials and tribulations. I'm not saying that. Because there will be. But I found in, in, uh, in my work as administrator in healthcare industry that if I would take care and talk to the person that does the floors, who cleans the bathrooms, the rooms, all the way up to everybody in between. At the end of the day, I felt good about what I was doing and they felt good about what they were doing. 
And see, that's what was supposed to be happening here. But we find that didn't necessarily take place. It says there in the first paragraph, We have long desired and tried to obtain these blessings, but have not received them because we have cherished the idea that we could do something to make ourselves worthy of them. We have not looked away from ourselves, believing that Jesus is a living Savior. We must not think that our own grace and merits will save us. The grace of Christ is our only hope of salvation. And through his prophets, the Lord promises, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. That's from Isaiah 55, 7. We must believe the naked promise and not accept feeling for faith. When we trust God fully and when we rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior, we shall receive all the help that we can desire. Well, that's a very short formula there. It says when we trust God fully, it doesn't say when we trust God half the time or 90% of the time. It says, when we trust God fully and when we rely upon the merits of Jesus, that's number two, trust God fully, rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior. Rely upon Jesus as the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior. We shall receive all the help that we can desire. Now, that doesn't take anybody with a bunch of degrees to understand that. And that doesn't take a week-long seminar to understand that. Pretty simple to me. Pretty simple. Trust God fully. Rely upon the merits of Jesus as a sin-pardoning Savior. Remember, I told you, I read earlier about if, if you don't, uh, release all of your sins to God and, ask, and repent of all your sins, they don't, go any, they don't come off the books. Remember, I read that to you to start with. Okay? So if we don't repent, they stay on the books. They don't come off. All right. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 59. Read Isaiah 59, 2. Juan, if you'll start off there, please. And I want you to read verse 1 and 2. And the question is, what message is being given here that answers the question in Isaiah 59, 1? And I also want to uh, get this out there to see if there's any comments on this question. You know, on page uh, 98 of your study guide today, there is a discussion question. So I'm going to throw it out now so that you've got plenty of time to think about it. It says, the Seventh-day Adventist pastor thoughtfully stated that his number one problem in ministry is the exclusiveness of church members who do not want others to join them. How can Christians take the love, hope, and good news of Christ's kingdom to all the world so that others can have an opportunity to be saved before the end comes, when they do not even want to accept people who go out of their way to show up in their church. Think on that one a little bit, and it gives you a verse they refer to, Matthew 24, verse 14. So you be thinking on that one. I'll come back to that in a few minutes, or if you've got a comment on it, you just jump in any time and share with us. Go ahead, Juan. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So your iniquities. Iniquities are what? Sins. Your iniquities have hidden you from God. Well, 
You know, it says right there underneath it in the reading, it says God chooses to ignore his people not because that is his desire, but because, as he just read, your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God. Huh. When we find ourselves going down a road that is apart from God, do we have a real desire inside of us to have Bible study? Do we have a real desire to listen to Bible sermons? Do we have a real desire to watch things on the television that deal with biblical aspects? I don't think so. I don't think we do. And what it's saying here it says not because it's his desire, but because your iniquities have been barriers between you and your God. So, you know, blame is going where blame should go. Um, sin, as it mentions on down further here, is a primarily a rejection of God turning away from him. The sin actually feeds upon itself in that not only is the act a turning away from God, but also the result of the act causes the sinner to turn away even more from the Lord. Turn away even more from the Lord. Goes on to say, but because sin causes us to reject his divine overtures to us, that is why it is so important that we tolerate some sin in our lives. No. What does it say? No sin in our lives. That we tolerate no sin in our lives. Now, you know what the word tolerate means, right? We put up with it. It's the way it's going to be, we put up with it. And right here it's saying that we tolerate no sin in our lives. Let's look at the next page, page 94. Who is forgiven? Who is forgiven? Lawrence, I'd like for you to read Romans 3, 21 to 24, please. 21 to 24. And... Um, the, what, what we're looking at here, the question is, what are these verses telling us when about how we are saved? What hope should they give us in the judgment? Because the question for this lesson on Monday, page 94, is who is forgiven? Who's forgiven? And also along with that, I hope you read Isaiah 59, 15 to 21. That goes along with this study. But we're going to look at Romans 3, 21 to 24 now as Lawrence reads that. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, what he's just shared with you is, how many have sinned? All. all. There's X amount of people in this room today and X amount listening on the internet. All have sinned and come short from the glory of God. So I guess if I end my study today and say all of sin and come short from the glory of God and you can you know, reflect on what I said earlier about the children of Israel and so forth and we go home and we have a nice lunch today. 
Was there anything else that he read there that we should dwell upon? Didn't he say something about righteousness? Yeah, the righteousness of God manifested to what? In Jesus. What does it do for us? Yeah. And to all who believe that, Salvation is available, or is it just some? It's available to all. It's available to all. You see, there's nobody on this planet today, nobody, that gets a, a free pass. Jesus God sent his only son to die for everybody on this planet. It doesn't matter who your daddy is or who your mama is. It doesn't matter because they can't stand in the judgment for you. You have to stand for yourself. Your wife, doesn't matter who you're married to or your husband, doesn't matter. They are not going to be able to stand for you in the judgment hall either. Doesn't work that way. We all stand for ourselves. And if we understand what he just read, there is hope for everybody in this room today. It's not based upon how many good works you did or how many visits you made to the prison or how many meals you took out here to the people down the street or how many individuals you got baptized, you said you, you think you did, but it's not based on any of that. Now, those are all good things. I'm not saying they're bad things. But you know there's also a text in the Bible where it says, that these individuals will plead before God and say, hey, I did this, this, and this. I took care of these people. I took care of people in my home. I invited people that didn't have any place. I did all these things. And you know the saddest thing when you read the Bible in that story is what? What does he say? I don't know who you are. I don't know who you are. Oh, that's some sad words. Real sad. Real sad. You know, it, and, you know, I've, I've already answered that at the next point there. It says, why can't work save us either now or in the judgment? Works are an outward expression, the human manifestation of a saving faith. Hence, a true Christian experience is one in which faith is expressed in a daily commitment to the Lord that is revealed by obedience to the law. Let's look at the next study here on page 95. Universal appeal, and what it says here is Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. And Trish, if you would read that, please. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. And it says, what are we talking about here? And what principle do you see at work there that's been seen throughout the Bible? And what hope does it offer? Go ahead, please. Isaiah 60, verses 1 and 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. What a statement that is, those two verses. Your light has come. 
The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. Folks, think about that today, where we are. Would you say that we're in deep darkness today in this world? A lot of deep darkness out there today. And if a person dwells on that, and you get up every day and you dwell on that and you keep dwelling on it, it will eat away at you. It will eat away. Because you're going to get to the point where you're going to say, well, what? what's the use? And there are people who have gone down that road. What's the use? But he's telling us here, Isaiah is, arise and shine, for your light has come. There are people out there in the darkness that need your light. They need your light today, this afternoon, next week. They need our light. You may say, well, hey, I'm only running at about a 20 watt that should be an 80 watt bulb. Well, okay. 20 watts better than no watt. That's some light, and it'll grow. Because, you know, it tells us in the scripture, by helping others, we help ourselves. ourselves. Yeah. We do. And I'm not saying that that's the motive you should use. I'm just saying that's a fact that, that comes with it in helping others. Well... Notice here, it's interesting, uh, under verse 3. Now, verse 3 says, The Gentiles shall come to your light. Huh. And kings to the brightness of your rising. That was our text that we started out with this morning. They're going to come to your light. Hmm. Think about that a little bit today, where we are. Right here in Anderson, Indiana this morning. If somebody comes through those doors, and I started out with this question, I haven't received any feedback. But if somebody comes through those doors this morning, what is our reaction to them? Because right here it says, The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Hmm. What if the mayor walked in here this morning? Or the governor of Indiana? Would we treat them differently than we would the guy or gal that just came in off the street? Why? Mm Mm-hmm. Prejudice, yeah. Well, you could even take that further and say, well, that probably the person of wealth or power or position might do something for us. As the person who just came in off the street, I keep going back to this verse 3. I hope you have it in front of you there. Chapter 60, verse 3 of Isaiah the Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. The Gentiles shall come to your light and the kings to your rising. That's, a, that's powerful. Go ahead, please. Just, uh, we don't know when we're entertaining angels. Right. You know, yeah. and... Uh, it's much better that we love everybody that comes in. And I think for the most part, that's what I see here. 
That's why I come, that I've always felt openness from the people that are here. And I, I love to see the diversity in this congregation. And, and I enjoy that in the Seventh-day Adventist on a whole. But we don't know. And, and fortunately, I might recognize Holcomb. But those other guys, probably not. I, I mean, I'm better off to treat everybody the same because I don't know. And I don't want to do it for what you can do for me. I want to do it for what he's done for me. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good thoughts. Very good thoughts. You know, on page 96, it talks about the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor. And it says, who is speaking in Isaiah 61.1? Who is speaking in Isaiah 61.1? Nikki, you want to read that, please? Isaiah 61.1. Isaiah 61.1. Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Hmm. Hmm. Spirit of God is on this anointed person, which means that he is a Messiah or the Messiah. And notice what she just read. To preach good tidings to the poor. Heal the broken heart. Proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Hmm. Jeff? Got a comment from Janelle again. She says, when we spend time with God daily desiring to know him personally and honest, honesty, honestly desiring to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the result will be a desire to share with others the message of hope in Jesus. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit's work. When we fail to spend time being connected with God personally, one, we won't have anything to share, and two, if we try to share anyway, it will be under our own power, not by the Holy Spirit's power, and we'll burn out. However, if we are connected personally to God, uh, we will have a genuine love for people, all people, and a passion that's contagious. And the passion is contagious. That's interesting the way she ended up there and used those words. The passion becomes contagious because we're taking time every day and spending time with Jesus. Very good, Janelle. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for getting up early this morning and being with us. Um, When you think about what she just said, uh, spending time, and we will want to share that with others, and it will become contagious. Hmm. You know, I have a lot of people who ask me about different things that are going on now in the world, and they say, well... uh, It must all be the signs of the times and Jesus is coming soon. I I won't disagree with that. I don't know when he's coming. I don't know the hour nor the day. But yes, he is coming back. There's no doubt about that. And when you look at that in relationship to what we are doing, then we need to do some soul searching, each one of us. Are we helping that? Are we hindering it? Are we slowing it down? Remember what I shared with you when I opened up, how discontent and dissatisfaction, how it can be contagious. It can be just as contagious as the positive things that John L. has just shared with us. We have a choice in relationship to that, each one of us. And, you know, as I stand here from week to week, I don't want anybody in this room to ever think, well, that guy up there 
he must not have any problems. No, that isn't the correct assumption. I am no better off than anyone else sitting here today or listening out there on the Internet. I'm just the one here today to facilitate the teaching of this lesson and share some thoughts that trigger some thinking, I hope. Well, haven't received any feedback. Anybody have some feedback here they want to give me on that discussion question that I asked earlier there off of page 98? Off of page 98. Well, let me share some more things with you to think about. Let's see here. Um, the Perishing Center, and those of you that have a little companion book, it's called E.G. White Notes. I'm on page 84. And I'm on the one, two, third paragraph. It says, the Perishing Center may say, I am a lost sinner, but Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. He says, I came not to call the righteous... Hmm. but sinners to repentance. I am a sinner, and he died upon Calvary's cross to save me. I need not to remain a moment longer unsaved. He died and rose again for my justification, and he will save me now. I accept the forgiveness that he has promised. And that comes from a book called The Faith I Live By, pages 111 and 112. With deep solicitude, I'm dropping down two paragraphs. With deep solicitude, heaven watches the conflict between good and evil. None but the obedient can enter the gates of the city of God. Upon those who choose to continue in transgression, the death sentence must at last be pronounced. The earth will be purified from their misdoings, their defiance of God. Over here on the next page, page 85, staying in the same little book, E.G. White Writings. About halfway down, it says, The acceptance of the Savior brings a glow of perfect peace, perfect love, perfect assurance. The beauty and the fragrance of the character of Christ revealed in the life testifies that God has indeed sent His Son into the world to be its Savior. The Lord in compassion is seeking to enlighten the understanding of those who are now groping in the darkness of error. Hmm. Remember I, we said we were going to be the light? Arise, get up, you're the light. Well, we got people that are out there groping in the darkness of error. He's delaying his judgments upon an impenitent world in order that his light bearers, you ever think of yourself as a light bearer? may seek and save that which is lost. He is now calling upon his church on the earth to awake from the uh, lethargy that, I think I pronounced that right, that Satan has sought to bring upon them and fulfill their heaven-appointed work of enlightening the world. Heaven-appointed work, enlightening the world. We've mentioned that more than once this morning. Light to the world. That's what we are. Well, our time has come to an end. And um, I hope you've enjoyed the study today. The day of vengeance of our God. That was the part I didn't get to on page 97. But do read that. I hope you've studied it. I hope you are following along in the study of the scripture from the book of Isaiah. Next week, folks, is the last week for Isaiah. Last week. And um, we've got to get some, uh, I think they're out there in the back, aren't they, Lawrence? Quarterlies for the next uh, quarter. Be sure and pick those up today so you can be prepared in two weeks. Two weeks from today, we'll start that study. But next week is our last study from the book of Isaiah. We're going to finish it up. And uh, I hope that all of you have enjoyed that study.